long day. Um, it really gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce Kath Maitland, who is the Professor of Pediatrics at Imperial College in London, but is based full-time in East Africa, where she's really done amazing research. And um, I think she spent most of her career improving the care of critically ill kids. So the trial she's done would be the FEAST trial that I think we all know very well in Africa, looking at fluid um, boluses and fluid resuscitation strategies. She's also done the TRACT trial that we were discussing earlier, looking at transfusions in children with severe life-threatening anemia. And then also the COAST trial, looking at oxygen use um, for children needing oxygen. And what's really impressive about Kath's trials is they're always in multiples of three or 4,000. So Kath, I'm not quite sure how you managed to do that. Um, most recently, um, we're going to be looking at tonight's study, the gastro study, looking at aggressive versus slow treatment for rehydration, as well as gastro SAM trial, looking at the management of gastroenteritis and severe malnutrition. And then just something that we're really proud of is that she's recently been appointed in the UK with an OBE in the 2022 birthdays honours list. So, Kath, do we now call you Dame Professor Maitland or do we call you Professor Dame Maitland or do we just say thank you very much, Kath, for taking time and fine. <laughs> the pediatric webinar. Over to you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for a lovely introduction, Minion. I, I don't know how far we go back. I don't know when we first met. I think it was well before the feast trial. <laughs> but uh, so I'm going to share my screen. and go to full presentation mode. So good. does everybody have this slide? So I'm going to take you through um, quite rapidly the, the, um, the background into the management of um, uh, gastroenteritis, basically severe dehydration, which I'm, I'm primarily focusing on, um, and the evidence supporting it, what it what it is, and um, and some and some of the challenges, and the reason why we wanted to do a, a phase two trial. So it's nothing like feast. Um, it's it's a phase two trial with a, a view to moving the uh, the sort of this science forward um, uh, for the next question. And then I'll finish the seminar with um, a, to, to discussing severe malnutrition and what, what are the challenges related to fluid rehydration there. So unfortunately, gastroenteritis still remains a very, very uh, you know, common cause of morbidity and, and mortality um, in children in, uh, under the ages of five. Most of those deaths occur in Southeast Asia and Africa. Um, in a child who is hospitalized with, I've called it GE, gastroenteritis, but it's, it's a diarrhea, severe diarrhea, they're eight, eight and a half times more likely to die than um, um, other counterparts that are uh, that are admitted. So overall, so it is it, it remains still a, a common cause of mortality. Interestingly, although the, the, the mortality occurs over a period of about two to three months, actually about a third of those will happen within the, within a, less than a week. Um, and so that means that uh, it, uh, it, there's obviously something about that early management that's probably not, not right. So what we want to know is, are those treatment recommendations working in practice? And this is quite a busy slide, it just, just to remind us um, um, I've, I'm not only seeing, I'm half, I'm, yes, that's better. I've just hidden all, all, all your photographs. Uh, your, your, um, so just to remind you the classification of uh, diarrhea, this, is, this comes directly out of the WHO handbook. Severe dehydration is defined with uh, clinical signs. You've got to have two or more of um, altered consciousness, sunken eyes, inability um, to, to, to drink or drinking poorly, um, or um, uh, a skin pinch, um, so basically um, delayed uh, re, uh, sort of a skin pinch, and so and they are the ones that we're primarily focusing on in 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 my trials. Is they they are recommended to be given uh, uh, rehydration according to WHO IV rehydration. Now the one of the biggest reports of uh, this came from some of my colleagues in Kenya. They actually looked at the outcome. Um, it's been published uh, a while ago in Lancet uh, Child and Adolescent Health. And they actually found that uh, 
children who are admitted with gastroenteritis and severe dehydration. There's a large number in this, this, this study. Um, overall, 9% died. But if you actually had those two, condition, th those two uh, uh, conditions and shock, then that increased to 34%. Their conclusions, although they, they didn't have evidence to really support this, that they felt that they were probably not getting uh, the, uh, the fluid uh, management uh, bo uh, recommendations by the uh, WHO. But um, So I'm just going to move to the next slide. Sorry, my slides seem to be frozen. Oh, right. OK, sorry. So what are the uh, rehydration guidelines? So again, this is we're focusing on severe dehydration. Um, and so what they recommend is that if, with those two, one of those two signs, if you do not have mountain um, dehydration, you will be given rapid rehydration. Remember, most of the fluid that we're talking about is largely in the intracellular space. What you're looking at is sunken eyes and delayed um, uh, skin, looking at skin turgor. That's all intracellular um, space. It, we're not looking at the vascular system and that could be expanded more slowly, but they, they're really focusing on, it's treating it almost like shock and giving it as rapidly as possible. Um, so, but they recommend two different uh, phases and two different uh, rates for children in um, according to age. So this is quite confusing to start with. Um, so it's, I mean, effectively, it's over. You you give the first 130 mils per kilo in those who are uh, one year and above over 30 minutes, um, and then, uh, but if you are less than 12 months, you give it uh, over an hour, and then you complete the rehydration over two and a half hours if you're over 12 months, but over five hours if you're. Uh, and I I wonder with any of you really remember all of this, but then you go on to sort of see how then they treat and integrate this with shock management, and it goes across a number of pages. Um, so you'd be, you'd be, rather than looking at a single chart or a single page, you're flicking between different charts and different pages, um, especially if you've got a child with shock. And they recommend to give up to three boluses of uh, 20 mils per kilo before rehydration if you've got shock. So actually, I've just simple try to simplify this into one page um but effectively just trying to sort of say that this is what the recommendations are and that if you actually followed the guideline and sub um, and either subtracted or didn't subtract your what your bolus volume you'd given you'd be giving 130 to 130 mils per kilo over about uh, three hours um which is quite a lot of fluid if, if you're above one year of age so but also then I looked at the, the bottom bit and it also, but if you didn't follow them and you got all confused and you, there was no subtraction for boluses, then you could be giving that child a lot higher. Uh, they say that actually, if you still got a weak pulse, you have to repeat all of that again. So uh, this is, you know, they, these kids could be exposed to an enormous amount of uh, uh, fluid. So we, as, as to start when you think, well, where, we, where we, would we go from this? The first thing you do is look at the evidence. Where did this evidence come from? Um, and we did a, a systematic review. And the only thing that we identified was three trials, um, a, a very, very small number of patients. No single trial has been done in a lower middle income settings. So that's surprising, given the fact that most of the mortality is there. And of the trials that were, were done um, largely in America, um, there were no deaths. So they, they can't help us inform the, you know, the guidelines. So wh where am I coming from? I'm, I'm obviously, um, it has been mentioned before, this, you know, this was a big, big surprise for us. We didn't set out to show fluid boluses were harmful. We set out because we thought we were doing the right thing and saving lives. So you can have unexpected um, events, but children who had gastroenteritis were not included in this. So we now have been looking at some of the unresolved questions that are my last sort of decade of research has been sort of started off with feast but then there's a whole pile of other studies that we need to do first of all in gastroenteritis does aggressive rehydration is that is that harmful um particularly we're but we're also looking at severe malnutrition and i'll talk a little bit about that later so there's we've as i say we've published a whole pile of things adding mo a lot more physiology um certainly in the feast trial um ovine models of sepsis 
um, and also looking at um, what happens to cardio, cardio, cardiac function uh, in, in children given boluses. And that's the first two studies. But for, for this particular um, topic, what were our hypotheses? That um, obviously in children who come in with severe uh, dehydration, secondary to diarrhea, these very complicated diet plans, could they be sort of simplified so people can follow them? Um, and then obviously we're a concern that the volume that's being given, because remember in feast, we only gave them 20 mils per kilo. 20 mils per kilo over one hour. So almost some people thought that was almost homeopathic and that showed, that showed it was harmful. These kids are getting a lot of fluid over a short period of time. You know, are, you know is, could this be extended to our concern about poor outcomes um, through um, intravenous rehydration using plan C? So we designed a small phase two trial um, looking at the WHO compared to a what our, our hypothesis was that can we give the same volume, but um, give it more slowly over eight hours? So that's the that was the experimental arm, gastro um, sounds it's gastro, sorry, it's slow arm. We were not going to give any boluses. So you went straight to rehydration with no boluses, irrespective of the child had features of shock. But then obviously for the other side, we followed the um, plan C. We would then, uh, they would, if they were shocked, they had, um, they would get up to two boluses, but then we would subtract from what they had already had, and then they'd get, they'd get the following rehydration. We collected it, important um, clinical, biochemical, and physiological data over at, during admission and then up to the day uh, seven. Now, even although we were doing this trial in the trial centers that had already done the feast trials are very very familiar with trial methodology following the protocol we really found really really struggled getting this the clinicians to follow plan, plan c they were very very confused we had to do lots of training and retraining to make sure everybody followed that so this is what we call a trial pro we're just showing that uh, they basically everything was balanced um, 122 children were randomized um, and um, we've got complete data on all of those children um, to, to, um, to follow up. Just a couple of things to show you this. The plan C is the standard arm. Gastro slow arm is the intervention, the uh, experimental arm. Your median age of, um, of children uh, coming into the study was um, between eight and nine months, similar in both arms. Um, a, lot, a lot of them have multiple features of uh, dehydration, as you can see in the, the, the second uh, bit that was uh, flagged. Um, and quite a number of children had altered consciousness. So we were actually in, in enrolling quite sick children. What did surprise us is that uh, the number that actually had um, severe um, deranged uh, electrolytes, M many children had hyponatremia, but hypernatremia, severe hyponatremia was present in between 20 and 30%. And this is something that the WHO hadn't expected because in other places, severe hyponatremic um, dehydration is managed on, on a separate protocol. So I was just flagging that um, to, to, to let you know. So this was really showing you that we, everybody, the adherence to what they were meant to be given. You see that uh, the, the, if we start off with the green line, that's the slow rehydration that gets to a hundred mils per kilo. In other words, 10% dehydration at that eight hour time point. And then you've got the other two lines. One represents the, the faster one and children over age of one year and the slightly slower one um, for the children under the age, uh, age of 12 months. So really this was about safety. And so we had um, relatively, because everybody followed the protocol pretty well, uh, we had relatively few uh, adverse events and mortality was pretty low, um, which was, was surprising. We, we saw um, a couple of children who had cardiovascular uh, um, events, um, but they were felt to be probably unrelated. But overall, once again, this, this concerning biochemistry that actually still at 24 hours, we still had quite a lot of deranged biochemistry. Um, so that, that was, again, that was something that was of um, significant concern to us. 
these are all the other secondary endpoints and effectively we really found no difference in terms of time to tolerate oral fluids, correction of the signs of dehydration, time to pass urine and time to discharge. They were all um, the same. So suggesting that, um, sorry, I haven't moved on a bit too fast that, you know, actually that there was, yeah, there was no concern about a slower rehydration. We did do cardiac measures because cardiac cardiovascular collapse was the, the major cause of the excess mortality in feast. And while we didn't see any difference in the uh, troponin levels or the um, BNP levels over time uh, between the two arms, what we did see um, um, at most stayed within almost um, within the normal range. What we did see with ANP is after that rehydration, it went from being in a relatively normal range to sub substantially higher range. And that persisted to day um, uh, seven, completely massively elevated, suggesting that there was, this was stressing the heart. We also then went back, uh, because we brought children back at seven days, we went and used that time point to, to reweigh them and said that was probably the same as their pre-illness weight. And so we then asked how many would have had 10% dehydration. And again, it shows that actually would be, being very aggressive, uh, uh, we thought that they, they would have had 10% um, um, loss, but in fact, uh, um, about only 30% of those children had a 10% uh, loss. This is known. It's um, very, very much known that obviously the WHO and the Gorlick scales have been found in systematic reviews not to be very uh, accurate at identifying the degree of uh, dehydration, um, the, the, the accuracy. So again, this is, again, you've got a you've got a, a, a guideline recommendation based on a clinical assessment, based on very weak level of evidence, uh, just again, building up the case, that, that case. So really just summarizing the, the, the findings from the gastro study, we found that hyponatremic dehydration was more common, um, yet it's still, it would be, because that's not being considered as something significant, you can't to, you know, differentiate those children clinically, you know, that they would normally be having a much slower rehydration regime. Uh, I've just flagged up the, uh, the paucity of the accuracy of the, the signs of dehydration in terms of determining how much loss the child has had. Um, we found that the slow rehydration and no boluses was much easier to implement without any safety concerns. Um, but so sorry, many were, were screened as not eligible. And the reason, when we, although we screened lots and lots of children, quite a lot of children, because they were dehydrated, suddenly, and they had, uh, you know, moderate under, undernutrition, they actually slipped into the severe malnutrition category based on their weights, um, uh, simply because they, they were dehydrated. So again, they were actually not, they, they're actually currently not given IV rehydration. So I think that uh, it's, it's really sort of goes back to the point is that obviously this is an emergency treatment uh, and given very, very, very rapidly. Um, it's based on low quality of evidence. Um, given the, uh, even although we didn't see the poor outcomes in this trial, it's largely because they were very, very closely managed. You know, this is the baseline of saying we need to do a much larger trial. Um, so it is published, it's, it's, it's available, it's had quite a lot of accesses, um, and I've already really summarised um, the, uh, um, the, the results in, in the last few slides. So what about severe malnutrition? Obviously, they've been, they were not included in that, in that previous study, um, and they weren't included in the FEAST trial, largely because there's, there's enormous concern that, and, and that's been sort of embedded within the, uh, the, the, the guidelines for children for um, uh, 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 children with severe um, mal malnutrition. Um, most of the statements that it's, uh, are said that the heart is shrunken, but 
is it shrunken or is it just equivalent to the actual body mass of the child? They are unable to cope with intravenous flu fluids. You should, you should be avoiding IV at, at, at all costs. And um, they're prone to sodium overload. Um, they, if you do give them infusions, you can precipitate heart failure and uh, particularly the children who have quashiorkal. And also they're at risk of refeeding syndrome. So again, these are largely cardiac arrhythmias. Again, this is expert opinion, the lowest quality of evidence and is not actually been updated over the last um, um, two decades, despite um, emerging um, uh, information. And I'm just gonna cover that. One was obviously the, the study that we conducted that looked at myocardial function in children. It was a case control study where we actually looked at uh, not just children with severe mal malnutrition, but we also um, enrolled these children who were hospitalized, um, um, children who were had who were severity matched. So if you had a child who came in with severe uh, malnutrition and, and uh, gastroenteritis, we would enroll a, a child with gastroenteritis who who didn't have malnutrition. So we basically had a, a control population who had an additional comorbidity, but they, you know, so we were able to match them on, on severity. And we then looked at multiple parameters of heart function. So effectively, what we found is the fractional shortening, which is a, a quite a good measure of global cardiac functioning. We found no differences at admission um, and over time, day seven and day 28 between cases and controls. So this is quite a powerful. So effectively, what the perturbations that we're seeing in children with malnutrition are due to the underlying morbidity if we do see there's some compromise. Um, we've, we looked at systemic vascular um, resistance, which is a pretty good marker of intra, uh, intravascular filling. And they, we had extremely high levels of children uh, um, in SAM, um, uh, and that was significantly higher, um, not just at admission, but also over time um, uh, in, uh, compared to controls. So again, it, it looks like these kids do have evidence of underfilling. There was a number of children that did need rehydration. So we actually looked at the, how they responded. And again, this is children with se severe malnutrition and we were looking at not just sy 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 systemic vascular resistance over time and stroke volume, but we're also looking at the frank Stalin curves. We were able to look at those and everything going from a dot to a, a, a triangle in, in the upward direction meant they were, they were showing a, a fluid responsive uh, 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 um, Frank Starling curve. So the, largely all of them had fluid responsivity. Sorry, this is really just sh showing. So really I've just summarized that um, th those findings, but also we actually had halter monitors on the, uh, these children for up to uh, five days. Um, and we found, although they, some had um, some tachyarrhythmias and, and a, a number of arrhythmias, none of these were related to uh, significant clinical events or mortality events. They were largely asymptomatic. So there was no evidence of what we would say is refeeding syndrome. We compared, uh, because we had both marasmic children and quashiorkal, we found that their cardiovascular profiles were similar. Um, and um, we found no evidence of clinical uh, uh, cardiac failure. And we've, uh, as I said, we found appropriate physiological responses to IV fluids. So we were not the only people that is doing this. Uh, this, is, this was a much larger study than ours, and this was done in um, Malawi um, by uh, Jonathan Silverman, and uh, everybody knows Liz Molyneux. Um, and again, just this, I'm not going to go through all of these, but effectively, this was their conclusions. Cardiac index is preserved. In, in children hospitalized with severe acute malnutrition. When the children are stratified by degrees of weighting, the cardiac in index increases with worsening nutritional stages commensurate with a lower sy systemic vascular resistance, suggesting that, that some, possibly some degree of the, their wasting is they, they may be dehydrated. So despite 
this research uh, and a, a number of other things that have occurred since the beginning of the uh, the, the guidelines and that, which have not been updated for the last um, decade. Um, although they've done reviews of the guidelines, nothing has changed in terms of their strong recommendations to not um, give children with gastroenteritis and severe dehydration, rehydration fluids. So effectively, this is what their guidelines are saying, that you'll put children at risk of over rehydrations and complications like heart failure, no evidence. Uh, children with uh, acute diarrhea and severe dehydration are not given IV fluids, but only those with decompensated shock. That is a very, very late event and the mortality is incredibly high. Um, and they recommend non-physiological fluids to actually basically half strength fluids. In other words, th those that are probably more likely to cause heart failure than uh, the, the current one because of this obsession about the fact that they can't handle a sodium load. So when they sort of said that actually signs of dehydration are not reliable in these children, well, we've actually looked at these, these are children with severe malnutrition, a large database from Khalifi. And we found that actually there's quite a, num a large number of children that actually do have dehydration signs and also signs uh, um, of shock. They have a very high case fatality. So th all of this is sort of layering of evidence to suggest we really, really need to look at this guideline. We also looked at where they, what had had informed these guidelines. These are two um, systematic reviews that we did of intravenous, and but we also did one for uh, oral rehydration, which I won't cover again. And we found that there was only four studies, and, and they were which were conducted in low resource settings. Two were RCTs and two observational cohorts, and one included the what was a study that we we did. Um, that are assessed myocardial function. Again, uh, what we found is that there's no evidence of fluid overload or uh, fluid-related adverse events. Um, and again, this is data. This is data that's emerged over the last um, decade or more. And again, that hasn't really been incorporated. So the current strong recommendations for conservative rehydration of children with SAM are not based on on any of this data. Um, including this, uh, what, um, what we did um, in, in, uh, with Medicine Sans Frontier, looking at uh, myocardial and hemodynamic responses in children with severe uh, malnutrition. I'm not going to go into it, but again, it really, really supports that, you know, they have preserved myocardial function um, and they don't go into, if they're given fluid, they don't go into heart failure. So I've, uh, effectively, I think I've already um covered most of those uh we did see um cardio in in that study we did see cardiovascular compromise with persistent low um, systolic blood pressure and weak pulse which was associated with increased mortality and again any child that was given fluid was not uh, we didn't see any evidence of heart failure so i can't report on this study um it's a trial which we designed um and got funded again, it was a phase two trial. It brings uh, basically what we learned from our gastro trial, um, this slow rehydration uh, without um, additional boluses, um, and to to this to this group, but also standard of care, which would be plan C. So we're comparing two, high, basically giving them 100 mils per kilo compared to what the current WHO uh, recommendations are, which is no IV rehydration unless they have a uh, uh, shock and then they're given a, 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 a bolus over one hour and which can only be repeated once and then they go straight on to oral. So we've started that trial and we've obviously it started um, and had to almost immediately stop because of COVID. We've taken an, uh, quite a hit in terms of not being able to enroll subsequently but uh, uh, Medicine Sans Frontier have come on board. We've increased the sample size and we've changed the endpoint to a mortality endpoint. And we hope to get going with that um, shortly. And we hope to have some more data by the end of, uh, 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 by the early next year. So thank you for listening. I know that I've taken you through a whistle stop tour and I hope I haven't confused anybody, but I think it's a, a really important topic. And thank you for inviting me to talk. Thank you, Kath, for covering such an important topic. It's something we're seeing so much of at this time of the year in Cape Town, um, and I'm sure around the rest of the country. And what I really love about your work is that you always go and take those gospel truths that come out of 
so-called large systematic reviews, which are often just four or five um, patients or trials, and actually ask the questions, is this the right thing that we're doing? So thank you very much for your excellent evidence. Um, I'm going to hand over to Zia Dangle, who's the current president of SARPA, and then we'll move on to Rachel, and then we'll do questions at the end. Thank you very much again, Kath, and over to you, Ziad. Thanks, Minion. I'm just confirming that you're seeing the slides. Not yet. Oh, uh, share this one more time. I think, um, Kath, can you uh, stop sharing on your side? I don't know if that's just, ah, fantastic. Thank you. How's that now? Yeah, all good. Okay, well, um, good afternoon, colleagues, and thanks for um, allowing me to interject between two brilliant speakers and just spend one or two minutes trying to convince you um, why it's important for you to become a SAPA member. So, um, for me, and I don't see it changing now, so I'm just... Uh, if you look at the bottom left-hand side and just see if it's the little arrows. Like uh, Murphy's Law to... There we go. Ah, oh, wonderful. Okay, so um, very, very quickly, um, what has SAPA been doing? And I hope that the 350 people on this call are, are a testament to the amount of work that SAPA has been doing. And, and this is through education. I mean, we're trying to um, do these monthly webinars, there's workshops ongoing, and this has been happening from the for the last three, four years. And I'm hoping that the pediatric community is seeing the importance of these educational platforms coming through into the, into the child health arena. Secondly, it may not be um, as prominent, but the advocacy uh, campaign, so you may have seen a lot of that during COVID where SAPA has put on a number of statements um, regarding vaccination in children, regarding child health during COVID times, the indirect effects on children, as well as the management strategies towards uh, COVID in children. And importantly, SAPA is also uh, trying to unite the pediatric community, the subspeciality groups, the non-government organizations. Um, recently, you've seen a lot of talk from Reach, Reach for a Dream. So what SAPA is really trying to do is be this conduit for child health care in South Africa. And I'd, I'd urge you to go to the website um, and go in and, and see all the different activities that are happening. And this is the link for the website. There are other opportunities, and SAPA also forms part of the International Pediatric Association, as well as the regional office, which is the African office uh, for pediatrics. There are, there are conferences that have been held on the international stage and different types of meetings that SAPA is representing the South African pediatric community at. There's opportunities for conference attendance to different sponsorships. There's government uh, partnerships that have been going on. Uh, linking with ministerial advisor committees, et cetera, and also pharmacy and industry-led opportunities. So there's a lot of things happening uh, in the background uh, that uh, I would like to make you aware of. So these are the general objectives of SAPA, and I don't want to go through all this in detail, but really it talks to the same things that pediatricians all over the country are doing. Essentially, we are promoting the health and growth and development of children. We are advocating for them. There's a lot of prevention and promotion in this. At the same time, we're advocating for research in, in, in pediatrics, uh, postgraduate study, undergraduate study, and really promoting the profession and the well-being of its members as a profession. So these are the general objectives. And really, that, that lends me to the next slide. And that slide says, let's work together as a pediatric community. The community is not about the exco uh, being leading SAPA. The, the, the community is every single registrar, every single pediatrician, both in pub public and private practice, being part of one common voice. So I urge you colleagues on this call, if you feel that you align yourself and you believe in the ethos um, that's been displayed to you now, my suggestion to you is please 
consider becoming an active member of SAPA. And I know everyone's busy and I know everyone cannot be um, active to, to the most highest degree, but I think just becoming a member is as good as showing that your support is there for the pediatric community. If you click on this QR code, it will take you to the membership page. Or alternatively, we'll start sending a whole lot of these uh, alerts on the WhatsApp groups and the social media platforms, urging everyone to join the pediatric community. This is, there is no fees attached to this. The benefits are enormous. A simple benefit would be earning the CPD points from these webinars. There's lots of workshops that have, that have been coming around. There's registration for this workshop will be free for members. And also discount to the SAPA conference, which is going to be held in September this year. So this is the link. Uh, it takes you very little time, very few questions will be asked. In under two minutes, you'll become a SAPA member. So uh, with that, Minion, I'll step off and say, uh, thank you, and um, we look forward to the next speaker's talk. Thank you, Ziad, and I've just done exactly what you were doing as you were talking, and I've registered as a member, and it's not often that we actually get something for free, so uh, really want to urge everybody to join your pediatric community, so thank you for that, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Matthew to introduce Rachel. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, now it's my honor to um, introduce um, Dr. Rachel Mazzoli. She is currently the only pediatric gastroenterologist um, for the whole of Malawi and for the whole of KwaZulu Natal. And um, so she is one busy woman, always taking um, multiple referrals um, for babies that has got chronic diarrhea, liver failure. Um, she is also a council member um, for the Commonwealth Association of Peds Gastro, and she's got a special interest in chronic gastro, especially in cow milk protein allergy um, kids and children with galactosemia. And what I really like about Rachel's approach is that she always keeps it very cost effective in her work out, um, workups for these children with chronic diarrhea. Thank you so much, Rachel. Over to you. Thank you very much, Marty, uh, for the introduction, and uh, thanks for having me. So I'll be talking us through chronic diarrhea, and um, hopefully at the end, um, we'll be able to share some practical algorithms that you may use in evaluating your children with chronic diarrhea. Um, trying to get my slide to change. Try go to the bottom left hand corner and just see if it will click there. You may need to uh, share screen and unshare again. Oh, I should stop share and then. Yeah, so just try again, Rach. Try again, just un unshare and then share again. It happens to the best of us. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, just click on that. There you go, and you can see it. Awesome. Now. Well done. All right. Um, I have nothing to declare. So um, we will uh, look at a few definitions and um, we share on the triple burden of recurrent or persistent enteritis, and then go into the approach, looking at investigation, management, and then uh, time wheeling. We'll look at a few cases. So um, defining diarrhea can be a little bit uh, difficult, especially for mothers to actually describe or quantify how much diarrhea their children are getting. You can appreciate on the table above that there is such wide variation um, in the um, normal stool frequency in children. You can see the infant that is breastfed can have one stool in 10 to 14 days, and they can also have 10 stools per day. And then you have the older child who can have up to three stools per day. So um, there's, there's a lot to, uh, to grasp in terms of um, uh, definitions and what is normal. But WHO defines it as when you've got three or more loose or watery stools, 
taking the shape of the container in a 24 hour period and um, acute being less than 14 days duration and then persistent um, being of longer duration. But of, but of course, we're very worried if your acute diarrhea is persisting beyond seven days. And then um, I also have a chart uh, on, the, um, on the slide with the Bristol stool form scale. Sometimes it does help to show guardians um, the different types of stools, you know, like type six and seven are the ones we worry about for diarrhea. You know, does it look loose like porridge, porridge, or does it look like mash, uh, like gravy? You know, uh, maybe terms that guardians may be familiar with, with, uh, with using. So that can be helpful. Um, you can also look at diarrhea as an increase in frequency or water content compared to the previous pattern of the individual. And as, as mentioned, it's very difficult for one to quantify, but you're looking at stool outputs of more than 10 mils per kg per day. And in the adults, that works out to more than 200 mils per day. So basically, the gut handles um, up to eight liters per day of fluid in adults. So 90% of that is going to be absorbed by the mid-gut, the, the small bowel, and then the, the, the remaining one liter or so is going to be reabsorbed by the colon. So you have about 200 mils um, that, that you may um, uh, lose in the stool. So when you have diarrhea, it means that even the, uh, the colon is not able to reabsorb the amount of water that is there. Bear in mind that this, the, the colon is able to absorb more than five to 15 times from the small bowel. So you can imagine if one is having diarrhea, then it means it's gone beyond the capacity of the colon. So um, sometimes children may start with an infective cause of diarrhea and um, then the diarrhea can persist because the consequence of um, enteric infections is you may have mucosal injury. When you have mucosal injury, you may lose those brush water enzymes that you have lining the, um, the small bowel wall. And on those um, brush borders are enzymes like lact lactase that you can lose with the mucosal injury. And then children may end up getting a lactose uh, intolerance kind of picture, giving you an osmotic type of diarrhea. And then that can increase the diarrhea further. And then if the diarrhea continues, then they are at higher risk of becoming more malnourished. And then that can also predispose them to having more infections. And then with chronic diarrhea, you may have a relative acute infective onset, um, and that's the persistent diarrhea spectrum. But then you also have a wide diverse of causes. And these ones may be due to long-standing intestinal dysfunction, maldigestion, and malabsorption. And that's what I can hope um, to get you to um, get or um, go through in terms of evaluating your um, patient. But how big a problem is this? As mentioned earlier by um, Prof. Catherine, diarrheal disease is the second leading cause of death in children under five years of age. Most of these deaths are occurring in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as Southeast Asia. And if the current trends continue, then in 2030, we'll have about 4.4 million children dying before their fifth birthday. Hectic. We do need to recognize that and really develop approaches in preventing um, or shortening the length of diarrhea. Um, although we have these numbers, it's difficult epidemiologically to ascertain how much of this is contributed to by chronic diarrhea. Um, diarrhea can also contribute to 40% of disability adjusted life years globally. So when children have recurrent enteritis, there's, there's several other consequences that they may have. And I just wanted to bring to our attention that um, the triple burden of recurrent enteritis can comprise the has drop, so height for um, age um, Z score drop. There's, a, there's about 1,000 children per day who can die because of enteric infections. But these infections can help stand over 160 million children and 30% of them in lower um, and in less developed countries. 
And then to note is recurrent bouts of diarrhea can also reduce those capture pools. There's also um, literature that has shown that if you have chronic uh, or systemic um, infections, um, you may have resistance towards growth hormone and your organ response to growth hormone may be diminished or reduced. And then the next consequence is the cog hit, the cognitive cognition hit. Enteric infections can also rob cognitive development. Um, they can lose up to 10 points. And this is the case for one to five, um, and a fifth of all children. And then cognition may also be related to how many parts of diarrhea. So the more diarrhea episodes they have, the lower the cognition. And then lastly, there is the metabolic syndrome hit that enteric infections may increase adult obesity, um, causing metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease. So these are just important things to have in mind since the majority of our uh, persistent or chronic diarrhea start off with um, um, infective causes initially. So it's important to know the consequences of this. How do we actually approach diarrhea? You know, there aren't actually validated um, practical algorithms out there. So what I have are possible approaches that you may use, and I'll share one or two ideas. Um, here's a slide from Prof. Gittenberg, um, who looked at uh, considering chronic diarrhea being of more than 14 days, and you ask yourself three questions. Is there nutritional deterioration with dehydration? And if that's the case, what is the age of onset? If it's neonatal onset, then you may be dealing with congenital disorders of the gut. Otherwise, if it is an acute onset prior to normality, then you might have intestinal mucosal injury and that is your persistent um, diarrheal spectrum. The next question is, do we have nutritional deterioration without dehydration? The age and history of the onset is important, but if they have a good appetite, but they're just not growing, then you might have children with malabsorptive syndromes like exocrine, pancreatic abnormalities. And then if they have anorexia, then you might actually have an enteropathy with malabsorption. And that includes things like celiac disease. The last question is, is it normal nutrition in this baby? And are they well hydrated? And then um, we're talking about a category of children who are between six months and five years of age. What used to be called toddler's diarrhea is now under the room for criteria described as functional diarrhea. You know, and in these cases, they're actually thriving children. That is just one approach that one may use. I thought it is also important to consider pathogenic uh, mechanisms by grouping your diarrhea into different types. I like to consider um, diarrhea into four categories. Is it a secretory type of diarrhea? Is it osmotic? Is it inflammatory? And is it a dysmotility kind of picture? So that is, that is also another approach that one may use. Bear in mind that patients may not always read textbooks or behave. You might have an inflammatory type of picture that is so severe, with such severe mucosal damage that it can present even like a secretory uh, diarrhea, um, plus minus osmotic. But it just, it's just good to have um, that kind of approach. So when you have osmotic diarrhea, it's about what's happening in the lumen. You have osmols in the lumen and um, they create an osmotic gradient with net water uh, secretion and retention. So you get massive watery stools beyond what the colon is able to reabsorb. Then you have the secretory diarrhea, which is really about what is happening with um, electroline shifts among the membrane. And in this case, it doesn't matter what's in the lumen, right? Um, whether, whether there is um, uh, osmos in the lumen, you just have these endogenic secretions of substances that induce fluid and electrolyte shifts, regardless of the osmotic gradient. And then the other category is the dysmotility. So if you've got um, low transit time, you don't give enough time for things to be, to be absorbed. So you end up having diarrhea, even though you've got normal epithelial uh, structures. And then the last category is also a big one, is the inflammatory bracket. And there's a lot of causes for inflammation. We're talking about infective causes with colitis. We're talking about food allergy, presenting as an allergic colitis or egg pies. You can have immune problems, 
uh, primary immune deficiencies or autoimmune enteropathies. Um, so the inflammatory bracket can be very wide, but it's nice to have an approach and try to see which bracket you can place your patient. So the small bowel mucosa has got uh, lined with uh, brush water columnar epithelial cells, which are folded into a finger like filler. Um, this helps with improving and increasing the surface area for absorption. And then it's important to understand that you've got a lot of fluid movement through active transport of ions. And the major ions are sodium, chloride, and bicarb. So broadly, you have sodium from the mucosa to the serosa. This drives your absorption. And then you've got chloride movement in the reverse direction, and that drives your net secretion. You need to have an intact epithelial barrier um, for good small bowel function. Tight junctions are also um, necessary, and they can restrict the passive flow of, of solids um, um, after um, movement into the um, uh, enterocyte. And then you also need normal motility, as described earlier, so that you can allow time for absorption. And that also uh, may determine the net fluid movement. So the pathogenesis um, for diarrhea may, uh, may vary, but largely with the infective causes, you may have bacteria causes, um, especially secreting toxins uh, like cholera, for example, or enterogenic E. coli. And this, this can bind onto the um, epithelial cells, and then you can get a cascade of inflammatory reactions through cyclic AMP. And this can change the movement um, of, um, of fluids with net um, uh, secretion. And then um, viral um, um, pathology um, has also been noted. And you can get, for example, water virus that you go through the um, enterocyte and also um, resulting in a cascade of reactions, um, also calcium dependent uh, processes and then resulting in fluid shifts uh, that are abnormal for the bowel. And then you can have congenital diarrheas and um, these are very early onset, but we have, um, we have lots of transporter uh, channels that are very important and are genetically determined um, that are very necessary for fluid management. So if you if you um, lacking if you have genetic defects in these transporter channels, then you may have um, secretory diarrheas, or you may have osmotic uh, diarrheas. And then the inflammatory type of diarrheas, the mechanism is usually through mucosal injury. Here's a picture um, of one of the congenital diarrheas. And um, with congenital diarrheas, you can have what we call um, tufting enteropathy. And um, in this case, you basically have an um, intestinal epithelial dysplastic picture where you have little tufts of um, cells or epithelial um, structures that are aggregated together. And then when you look at them histologically, you might see the teardrop sign from this tuft. And children can present within the very few days of life with severe dehydrating diarrhea, and usually need TPN early on. And then MVID is the microvillus inclusion disease, just an example also of the congenital type of diarrhea. And um, you can see the normal type of villa, nice and long projections. It's not the case with the tufting enteropathies and the microphilus inclusion disease where you get um, flattening. You, know, you don't see those nice projections on these pictures, but instead you have this blunting. But with microphilus inclusion um, disease, you also get abnormal um, uh, secretory granules in the epithelium of the enterocyte, and then you have these little tiny microvillus inclusions and this abnormal um, epithelial uh, border basically um, results in malabsorption. So these are just examples of congenital uh, diarrheas and um, it's, it's important to know them. So how do we approach these children? We need a detailed history. We need to know what is the age of one sort of a diarrhea. And as with, as with examples I just gave, if it's in the first few days of life, they know you're most dealing with something congenital. If it, has, if it happens abruptly, then you might be dealing with something effective in nature. 
So the duration is very important. Remember, we're focusing on diarrhea that has been there for more than two weeks. Then the type of stool can be helpful. If it's watery, then it can either be osmotic or secretory, although it doesn't mean that an, a patient with an inflammatory type of diarrhea can't have a watery stool. These are just um, uh, most common ways that one can approach in thinking. If it's watery, then I need to evaluate whether it's osmotic or secretory. If it's mucus or bloody, most likely inflammatory. And if it's fatty, then you may be dealing with pancreatic insufficiency or cholestasis, or maybe congenital disorders with lipid um, transport in the epithelia in the intestine. You want to know if there's associated symptoms. Is there blotting or not? Um, what is the relation to feel to, to meals and what happens when they fasting? Is there weight loss or abdominal pain? Do they have an explained fever? Is there vomiting? Are they waking up because of uh, the diarrhea? And then you want to know about the dietary history. Are they exclusively breastfeeding? Because if they're having chronic diarrhea and because and they're exclusively breastfeeding, that's a problem. There is a problem there, and you need to look deeper. It may not necessarily be because of infection, but you want to evaluate could they have some or possibly metabolic problems, um, transporting channel problems, um, or food allergy problems. What about the family history? Do they have family history of atopy, family history of IBD? Have they traveled uh, recently or not? Um, you know, the other countries are present that are combating the cholera um, outbreak. So it's important to know the travel history. And then what type of medication has a child been on? You know, things like medication like uh, magnesium, phosphate containing medication may cause diarrhea, but also if there's overuse of laxative medication can also result in diarrhea. We need to know about the past medical and surgical history, especially if they had um, say uh, intestinal atresias early on in life and required massive gut resection and, um, and have got a short gut then that would be useful for you in managing your patient. Your examination has to be thorough. The key thing is the severity of the complications and then identifying extraintestinal manifestations of gut pathology. So what is the hydration status? Is there evidence of micronutrient deficiency? Look at the type of rash that they have. Does it look like a post-inflammatory rash or not? They're usually with hypopigmented um, areas. Is the child edematous or not? Are they clubbed? Do they have jaundice? Do they have arthritis? Is there eye involvement? It has to be thorough. Do they have abdominal distension with organomegaly? Or are they palpable feces or not? And then we also need to inspect the perianal area, especially when we're worried about primary deficiency and um, the, um, inflammatory type of diarrhea. So basic labs, you want to know the HIV status. Remember the majority of our patients, um, we have to be opportunistic with them. We need to know the HIV status, we need to know the immunization status, we need to know the nutrition status. So those are three things you must do for every pediatric patient that you encounter. In addition to that, look at the full blood count and the differential. Electrolytes are important. What is the calcium and magnesium and phosphate? Um, you may need to do celiac serology, you may need to do immunoglobulins um, just to do a, a, a screen for immunodeficiencies, and you may also want to do a CMD viral load. So just some notes. If you have a full blood count, there's a lot that we can learn from there. If they have a thrombocytosis, it might be a, a, a marker for chronic inflammation. So you're worried about CMPA, that's cosmoprotein allergy. They have inflammatory bowel disease. They could have iron deficiency or TB. If they have a low white cell count, you want to think PLE and intestinal lymphangiectasia is causing PLE. Low HB, anemia because of iron deficiency. It might indicate that a patient has anemia, chronic disease, but think about your inflammatory causes as well, including enteral, um, autoimmune enteropathies. And these autoimmune enteropathies can also have bicytopenias. Um, and so it's important to, um, to, to, to make the most of your full blood count. If there is eosinophilia, it might indicate allergic disease, but if you have normal eosinophils, it doesn't exclude food allergy. In eosinophilic gastroenteritis, um, you may have a synophilia and also think about parasitic infections. Uh, we need to know these abnormal electrolytes, especially with congenital diarrhea. You know, the blood gas and doing electrolyte screens would help to identify some children with um, other congenital problems like cystic fibrosis where they can have a metabolic alkalosis with low sodium and chloride. 
Your CRP and ESR may help with infectious or inflammatory diarrhea type of picture. And your NFT is also important. If you have a low albumin, it might be a mark of inflammation or protein losing enteropathy. You might see um, a race AOP or gamma GT with a cholestatic picture um, that may result in fatty type of diarrhea. And then you have groups of patients with immunodeficiencies like hyper IgM syndrome. Um, they tend to have cryptosporidium infections and they can have an associated cholangiopathy. So your LFT might tell you something. Uh, you want to look out for that. And then um, your transaminases may be telling you about extraintestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease. They can have um, autoimmune hepatitis. Um, think about celiac disease where they can also have abnormal um, transaminases. You can have syndromes like the syndrome. Um, this is very rare, but we have, um, uh, I know in Tigerberg, they have diagnosed um, children with that syndrome. They have um, trichosis, abnormal hair. They have um, hepati hepatitis, and then they have an enteropathy. And then don't forget your cystic fibrosis. The infection screen is important. You, know, you gotta include your CMV there. Um, and then you need to include your celiac screen. Remember that um, you, celiac disease is basically an autoimmune enteropathy due to um, um, gluten, um, the gluten enteropathy. So you need to make sure you have your IgA levels also sent through because you can get false negative antibody levels if you've got IgA um, deficiency. Stool tests are also important. Um, your MCNS will tell you if there's gut inflammation. When you have gut inflammation, leukocytes influx into the lumen, and you can get the leukocytes uh, picked up in the stool. So when you do a stool MCNS, you want to know, is this inflammatory? You're going to see leukocytes. And you might see red blood cells there, and that can suggest inflammatory diarrhea. If you have labs that don't actually do a microscopy and they only do cultures, you can actually dipstick the stool and see if there's erythrocytes or leukocytes. Um, but if there's fat globules, you might have impairment in fat digestion. And fatty acid crystals might indicate malabsorption. And then, of course, you receive these parasites or over uh, from the MCMS and any cultures. C. diff toxin is not something you want to do routinely, especially in kids below one, because the interpretation might be tricky because they can colonize it. And But think of those at risk, like those who've been on antibiotics um, for a long period of time with recurrent exposure, hospitalized patients, um, um, <clears throat> those who've been on um, chronic PPI uh, medication, you wanna think of those. Why are stool electrolytes important? Because they help differentiate between osmotic and secretory diarrhea. You wanna do or calculate the fecal osmolar gap. So we take the osmolality to be about 290 osmos. Um, uh, take a, a minus two times the stool sodium and potassium. So if you've got secretory diarrhea, you're going to have high concentrations of sodium um, in, the, in, in, the, in the stools. So you're going to have a very low gap. In the fecal small gap will be less than 50. And that would be more a secretory picture. But if, if you have a fecal small gap that's more than 100, then that's uh, more an osmotic type of picture. You can also look for fecal reducing substances as well and determine the pH, because if you have an osmotic type of diarrhea or carbohydrate malabsorption, most of those solids end up in the colon and then bacteria ferment this and produce gas and you can get bloating and you can get an acidic, acidic type of um, diarrhea. So you're gonna get a low stool pH. You can also do dipsticks and you might be able to get a uh, low um, pH as well in settings where you can't do uh, fecal uh, reducing substances. Um, the same with, uh, just to note with electrolytes, it has to be a liquid stool. Um, so turning the upper upside down is important and maybe putting urine back to try and collect the liquid stool. The stool elastase is important um, because if it's low, it might indicate pancreatic insufficiency. Normally it should be more than 200. But if you've got massive diarrhea, the stool, you can get a false low um, elastase in high volume diarrhea. So it's always important to check at the time you're doing the study, what was the stool consistency? And um, the calprotectin is also a mark of gut inflammation. It's a neutrophil product that will also influx, uh, influx into the gut um inflammation and you can pick it up in the stool. 
The stool alpha-1 antitrypsin is very good for assessing for protein-using enteropathy because the alpha-1 antitrypsin is not really um, absorbed or digested and you get very low quantities. And if you uh, measure the um, levels in the stool, then it may be an indicator of a protein-using enteropathy. Remember, you can also get extra-intestinal uh, extra -intestinal infections like urine tract infections that can also give you diarrhea. So it's important to also clean the urine. And then you want to do urine for reducing substances, which may be positive in patients with galactosemia or those with glucose galactose absorption. So here's a table to just highlight um, the, the different types of diarrhea. We looked, uh, we said that with secretory, secretory diarrhea, the defect is mostly reduced absorption. You get increased secretion you have problems with electrolyte transport. The stool will be watery. You're gonna have normal stool osmolality. The fecal osmolar gap will be less than 50 and there'll be no leukocytes. For osmotic diarrhea, you're usually due to maldigestion or malabsorption, maybe due to transport defects or ingesting um, unabsorbable solids, you know, um, your fiber, high fiber diet with non-digestible carbohydrates. Stool will be watery but you're gonna have very high stool osmolality. These will be acidic stools and those molar gap is, stool osmolar gap is gonna be more than 100. You may get positive reducing substances, but you shouldn't get stool leukocytes. In um, a dysmotility uh, type of diarrhea, you have a low transit time and you may also have a defect in neuromuscular units, um, but you can get loose stools, but you can also get normal appearing stools with normal osmolality. osmolality the stool pH should be normal. And in this case, you shouldn't see any um, leukocytes. And then your functional diarrheas and IBS, inflammatory, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, diarrhea type picture may also uh, come under this uh, bracket. Then the last group for inflammatory, the mechanism is mainly from mucosal damage. So you're gonna have a reduced absorptive surface. You're gonna have a low chronic reabsorption, uh, capacity, and then you might also have increased motility. Stools could be bloody, mucoid, um, and you will have stool, uh, stool leukocytes, and you may have a raised calprotectin. So if we take the watery type of diarrhea, here's an algorithm that one can also use um, in evaluating. So for watery diarrheas, you can have, uh, ask yourself, is there edema? Um, uh, most likely hypoalbuminemia, one wondering um, on your FPC for low leukocytes or lymphopenia, then you wanna suspect PLE. So you're gonna do your stool after our alpha-1 antitrypsin. And then you may also need to do um, endoscopy and biopsies to identify the actual underlying pathology, but intestinal lymphangiectasias may be um, possible causes. Now, if you're in a setting where you're not able to do stool electrolytes and so on, you can still determine if your child has got secretory or um, osmotic diarrhea. You wanna do a trial first. Um, so that means you're gonna observe what happens with the stool when the child is fasted. If the diarrhea resolves with fasting, or you have a stool osmotic gap that is more than 100, then you're dealing with an osmotic diarrhea. You want to check when the, uh, the, the diarrhea started, because if it started early on in life, then you're looking at um, uh, possibly congenital osmotic diarrhea. You may also want to rule out anatomical abnormalities, meaning to do an abdominal x-ray just to rule out the structural, uh, possible structural um, causes, and you may need endoscopy. If it's an older child, you might be able to do breath hydrogen tests um, uh, to, to demonstrate or show that you do have a child with uh, osmotic diarrhea. So if it is positive, then you need to couple high, you need to um, uh, monitor or modify the diet and um, you need to treat uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. If it is negative, then you need to evaluate further. These are children who might benefit from endoscopy and biopsy so that you rule out um, enteropathies. Now, if you fasted the child and there was nothing that happened, 
the child continue to pour out and you're dealing with a secretory type of diarrhea. Once again, if it's early onset in life, first few days, um, first few weeks of life, then you are worried about congenital problems. If they've got um, structural problems, it, uh, significant intestinal atresias, congenital short bowel syndrome, they may also um, um, come under this bracket. And these are the ones that could have um, uh, microvillus inclusion disease or tufting enteropathy and several other congenital secretory diarrhea. You can have um, uh, congenital chloride diarrhea, you can have congenital sodium diarrhea, and um, your severe autoimmune enteropathies can also fall under this bracket. For the older child, um, you may need to scope them, um, but you may also need to um, think about um, your VIP and uh, check for gastrin and calcitonin levels as well for neuroendocrine tumors. If it is an inflammatory... Okay, we just need to start wrapping up. Sorry, we're just running out of time. Thank you. Okay, no problem. So with inflammatory um, diarrheas, then you also need to rule out your necrotizing enterocolitis and don't forget your food allergies um, in the young infants. And then for fatty diarrhea, you also need to um, think about um, do they have edema or not and do your stool uh, studies. And then um, this is where you need to do your stool elastics to see if it's pancreatic sufficient or not. So management is really about recognizing them early, assessing the type of diarrhea and determining the severity. You need to resuscitate them, treat the underlying infection, and then nutrition rehabilitation is very important. Probiotics, there's still a lot of the, um, um, things that we need to learn. There's still insufficient evidence, but watch the space. And then empiric anti antibiotics only in selective cases, so your infective causes and in a uh, way you're suspecting um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So for secretory, mostly fluids, they may need TPN, and then you also want to treat the underlying um, cause. Um, if they've got a short bowel syndrome, you might consider the pyramide, which is an opioid um, uh, motility uh, agent um, that may help to um, reduce your outputs. For osmotic type of diarrhea, then we will also need rehydration. But what is important is this child has had chronic diarrhea. You, um, you need to consider a lactose-free diet. So if they're below one year, may consider the um, S26 lactose-free or Infasoy. And if they're more than one, you may give them Pediasure. You wanna keep them on for about two to four weeks before um, re-challenging the bath. And that challenge could happen in the home setting if they, depending on the clinical picture or in the hospital setting. The next step from lactose-free is extensively hydrolyzed feeds. And you wanna stop soft feeds if you've come to that. And if they're below one, you can use Pepticate, Alimentum or Fare. And if they're greater than one, you can use Peptimin Junior or Neutrini Peptisol. These are the children you need to do in hospital challenges, um, but after two to um, four weeks. And you challenge first to lactose free feed before you do standard feed. You need to stop any medication that can increase the solute loads, um, and you need to stop any laxatives. For functional diarrhea, it's mostly conservative management with reassurance and dietary modification. For motility, you treat any thyrotoxic causes that may be present and infections. For the inflammatory causes, you also treat any underlying pathology. Just important for food allergy, you want to do see calcium protein elimination, which is the most common food allergy in infants. If they're breastfeeding, then you want to continue breastfeeding, but mom must not be. Otherwise, if they formula fed, then they have to do an extensively um, hydrolyzed. Remember, they can outgrow, so you need to review the diet as they grow. And then you do specific management for the um, other causes. So in view of time, I just wanted to mention quickly one patient, the one case of galactosemia. They uh, were well, both the cases had chronic diarrhea, but what is important is um, the one was exclusively breastfed, and that is, um, that is uh, very important to note. Um, baby had gram negative UTIs, that's also very important for galactosemia. And the patient was self sufficient, the diarrhea resolved uh, on Infasoy. And then um, there is also a patient with CMPA that I wanted to mention that they had diarrhea with blood in the stool. 
This one had breastfed, uh, was breastfed the first weeks of life and then changed to exclusive uh, formula feeding and then the patient started having chronic diarrhea. Um, so when child's feed was changed, um, because they did have signs of inflammation on the um, results with high platelets and high ESR, removed um, remarkably when it changed to soy protein feed, was discharged, but came back because mom couldn't, she found the shocks closed and couldn't buy the infasoid. She gave standard formula and baby was back within 24 hours with diarrhea. And then the diarrhea subsided in one to stop. So that was um, 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 actually um, the way we diagnosed cosmic protein allergy. And then the last quick case was the patient with CF who was also exclusively breastfed, but baby had chronic diarrhea, was failing to thrive, and there were no leukocytes in the stool. They had very low sodium and low chloride. Stool elastase was less than 15, and the CF genetics were positive. And so this patient was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. So in conclusion, chronic diarrhea consequences include significant morbidity and mortality. We need to have good practical uh, approaches um, to help us evaluate them, and we need to refer them early for specialized care. Thank you very much um, for your attention. Thank you so much, Rach. That was a mouthful. Um, if everyone can just bear with us, we really have a couple of questions we just want to quickly get through. So I'm going to ask Mignon to just quickly ask Catherine a couple of questions about and um, that's been in the chats. Um, and just to say that these PDFs of the uh, presentations will be available on the website um, for everyone to look at later. Mignon, over to you to just quickly go through those questions. Brilliant. So two brilliant, brilliant presentations. Thank you very much. Um, Kath, so this is from Paul Mashanga. He is one of our fellows. He's now working in Zambia. Um, and he said, thank you for the presentation. We've seen a reduction in initial resuscitation boluses for shock in the non-malnourished from 20 to 10 mol per kilo. We are still using 15 mol per kilo for SAM patients with hypovolemic shock. I may have missed this because I joined late, but is there any change in the initial fluid resuscitation boluses for SAM in hypovolemic shock? Well, I just want to uh, thank him for raising that point. Um, yeah. This was, uh, so it would be very, very interesting to know. Uh, and, and I've done a poll with other people at a big a conference saying that they're using the 10 mils per kilo. And I asked, so which children are you giving 10 mils per kilo? And there was a whole range of answers and none of them actually got the WHO recommendations. So for 10 mils per kilo, you've got to have a, a cool peripheries uh, or cold hands, uh, a weak and rapid pulse, although it doesn't say, and a delayed capillary refill of four seconds or more. And, and I think a lot of people don't understand that. So in the FEAST trial, we only had uh, 64 patients that, you know, we screened thousands and they're, they're shockingly rare, <laughs> shockingly rare, but they have a very, very high mortality on. So the fact that they're, they're, they're still being given fluids, if that's, if people follow that, I mean, we're concerned about slippage. Um, so the 15 mils per kilo um, for the uh, the WHO severe SAM, again, is so you've got to have all of those four features and altered consciousness. Again, this is a really, really high risk group um, and it's just too little, too late. And it's probably the wrong thing. They just sort of kind of threw it in saying, don't rehydrate them, but you can give them a bolus if they've got a shock. Nothing's changed. Um, I think that kind of answers Jessica Price's questions as well about how do you explain the lack of increased mortality demonstrated in your work comparing the WHO standard of care plan, in, which includes boluses compared to slow rehydration, given the FEAST study findings where even smaller boluses were found to increase mortality risk. And I think it's those 64 patients that you had that were quite different, weren't they? Yeah, but they, they still had a, a very, very high mortality. 60% versus 20% if they didn't have a bolus, all in the same direction as the overall mortality. We've done a, a review on this and we looked at all of the evidence that how common is it? And it's very, very uncommon if you actually are very, very strict, but most people aren't. So I, I, I'm aware that Minion, you have to fly to the, uh, fly to fly. Uh, you've got to- <laughs>
But yeah, I think we've, Mignon, I think we just missed you for or lost you for a short oh, period. Yeah. Sorry. Did you okay, say right. one more question? Yeah, I was just going to say, Haroon, can you hear me again? Haroon Saluji's question, any comments about Rezomel versus ORS for Sam? We have done a systematic review of that. Um, and, <laughs> yes, uh, of course I have. Uh, and we're actually, that is a part of a factorial randomization in the gastro SAM. Um, it's, uh, and we're basically, the evidence behind that is pretty shocking. Uh, the, um, so it's, uh, again, it's something that, uh, the problem is, is that Risamal is hardly ever there in the country. So that means that because everybody's being told, oh, it's too scary to give them ordinary ORS, they still, you know, even although that that's what they're meant to be receiving quite often, it's not available. Again, very, very low quality of evidence surrounding that. There, there have been trials. The trials have shown that actually uh, those who received the lower um, uh, sodium uh, resomal ha had seizures. There was a high, but they focused on potassium correction and, you know, and one of the, you know, it, downstreams if you have severe hyponatremia you will, are, do have a risk of um, seizures the whole thing just needs better evidence base so whatever's already the recommendations they definitely need to be supported by the appropriate trials so prof can i ask if you have a severe sam edematous sam in front of you that is severely dehydrated what mm. would you do for the patient how would you rehydrate that patient well, I would, um, <laughs> I'd, I'd put them into a clinical trial. <laughs> no, but no, in terms of, I mean, we've, it's interesting because it's, you've got to say that if you want to do better outcomes, you would like to understand whether, is it that the fact that if I gave this child fluids that they had a poor outcome, or is it the fact that they're not getting fluids? Um, I, I would ideally like to rehydrate them. Um, I think that we've provided sufficient physiological evidence um, to suggest that they are very, very underfilled and they probably need uh, the volume, but they don't, nobody needs volume quickly, particularly if you've got dehydration. Uh, you need that slowly because you look at the compartment you're filling because that does not need to be replaced quickly, but you need to wait for the um, evidence. Uh, MSF have been waiting for us, for the gastrosam, because they are the body that manages in Africa the most children with uh, gastroenteritis and uh, severe malnutrition. So they're desperate for a result because they don't enjoy following WHO guidelines. I'm speaking for an enormous body, but they're... <laughs> No, sorry, but that doesn't replace your early aggressive feeding. And I think that's in, in, important in the SAM still. Although you're going to give them some IV fluids to rehydrate them, you should still yeah. be pushing to, to feed early. And that doesn't replace, that's not replaced by the rehydration fluid. So if you just said, I said, why don't we just give them the WHO uh, plan C guideline? I, I'm also concerned about that. It's very fast. Um, it, it sort of like looks like a shock type of sort of let's get it in fast, you know. Uh, um, and so if you want to say, well, they can just be exposed to what the current guideline is. I think the middle road, slow rehydration. Um, Good. I quickly want to uh, end with our four poll questions. OK, so first of all, I want to ask the two of you guys um, probiotics for chronic diarrhea. Yes or no? Me. Yes. Zero. No. I, I don't, I'm not, uh, I, I don't think the evidence is there. I think. Uh, yeah, sorry, you think? I think modifying their microbiome uh, ra rather than just giving probiotics, there are other ways to do that might be really important uh, because that has many. So that's another area that I look at in severe malnutrition, but that's, I don't want to even start with that. It's not probiotics. It's uh, actually legume based stuff. They're really short chain fatty acids and it really is good for the gut. Okay, Rach, what do you think? Now, there is a lot of research in the gut microbiome, but at present, there really isn't evidence um, with using chronic diarrhea. Okay, antibiotics for dysentery? Yes, no? Maybe? If you've got bloody diarrhea, I think you should uh, uh, treat it with uh, um, antibiotics, given the fact that there's a pathogen there. There should be a pathogen there because the blood is not normal. 
Okay, so it's safe to say start antibiotics and then obviously investigate and see where it goes. And um, yeah. zinc, does it, is there enough evidence just for us to say zinc, um, we should use it for all acute gastros or chronic gastros? Yes, no, Rachel? Yes, there is still a role for zinc. Um, we know it's advantageous in um, the uh, bowel integrity immune system. So, and we do know it shortens the duration of diarrhea. And we know the problems about the triple burden if you do not um, you know, shorten diarrhea. So I think, yes, we should still use zinc. And, and Prof? The evidence suggests it reduces mortality in kids with diarrhea. And so it's, 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 it's so, it, it, it's unlikely to cause harm. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. probably better that it's there than it's not there. But at the, 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 if, if you have a very low mortality, I still think it was, if you've got it, I would use it. Okay, and then the Bowie's cocktail. I think um, there was like, quite a lot going on in the Q&A about the Bowie's cocktail. I know, well, I'm, I'm with those people on the so, Q&A saying, what the heck is it? <laughs> yeah, so interesting. Um, what do you think? Should we use it? Should we use it in desperation or should we let it go? I'm going to I let the gastroenterologist um, answer that one. <laughs> um, you know what? We don't have validated evidence for this, but um, you know some societies, um, in the absence or in the absence of the evidence, have looked at, especially in the low risk of setting, at insulative patients. Um, when you think the underlying disease process is that of, of an osmotic nature and you are worried about for intestinal um, uh, bacterial overgrowth, then there may be a role for, uh, or you're suspecting for intestinal bacterial overgrowth, then there may be a role in, um, in starting your um, antibiotics. Usually metronidazole seems to be the antibiotic that most people use. Other centers would also add gentamicin, but metronidazole is what has also um, come up in some of the recommend recommendations for, uh, from some committees. And then because um, you get um, deconjugation of, um, of the bile salts by, by bacteria, you end up having a bile acid and diarrhea. So that is the thinking behind giving cholesteramine as well as part of the bile cocktail. Um, so it's, it should really be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think it's something that has clear evidence for one to use this as a, as a routine thing. Okay, thank you so much. And that brings us to the end of our webinar. I just really want to thank our fantastic speakers again. Thanks to Mignon for co-chairing with me. And it was really such an honor for me to have a, um, Prof Maitland as an international speaker. I always look at the studies and I implement a lot of her things in my daily work. So thank you so much. And thanks for Rachel for giving us such a great overview of chronic diarrhea. Um, and then to all of you guys for joining, thank you so much for, for coming on board. We promise you it's not always going to be this long. And um, now that you've signed up as a member, this is not part of the deal. But um, it was just such huge topics and we just wanted to get through some of the questions as well. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. And next month, we're going to look at raised intracranial pressure in children. And we will send you all the reminders about that. I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you.